start. Oh, there's a red light on. Does anyone want to go? Okay. So uh, my name is Kate Dickerson. I'm with the Maine Discovery Museum, and, and I get to be kind of the master of ceremonies here and do what I usually do, which is big, broad strokes, and then you get to hear from the people who will actually do the work. So just very quickly to do a quick introduction, uh, the Maine Discovery Museum uh, originally started as, well, I don't know what it originally started as, but most people in the area know it as the old Friese's department store, uh, which is that first picture over there, it's five floors. The number one question we get from people who come back is, is the, is the escalator still there? I don't know what they're talking about, so I say no. Um, but that's not so much. So we have three of the floors of the of the Friese's building. Um, it's a condo situation, so that we have neighbors, and we are a part of the Association of Science and Technology Centers, the National Informal STEM ne Education Network, and the Association of Children's Museums. We uh, started with a community forum in 1997, and in 2001, our doors opened. We have 21,000 square feet of exhibits and 27,000 feet of that building. Um, just to give you some context, the new Children's Museum that just opened up in Portland has 20,000 square feet. There's slightly less exhibit space than what we have. So they've got this big, beautiful building, which is great, and we, are still, have, we still have more exhibit space than they do. Um, in 2012, the board and the executive team of the Discovery Museum made a concentrated decision, concentrated effort to think about doing, being more than just a children's museum. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, but one of the things that they really saw the need of is, is this recognition that we needed to have more science and technology, engineering, math. Before you think I'm just going to go be all about that, critical piece for us is also that we include the arts in that. Um, I actually do have a background in science. These all these things on here, and totally not updated one of the logos, but these are our programs that have that started at the museum from 2012 on. The first one was the Maine Science Festival, and then these other ones have come into play. Um, one of the reasons that we've done that is kids are natural explorers, right? There's, there's one of my favorite books when my kid, when my son was a baby, it was called The Scientist in the Crib, and it talked about how babies are learning from a very young age by being basically perfect scientists. They did experiments as young as 45 minutes old on babies. It's just really oh, so cool. It's the coolest book. So we already know that we had kids who were scientists and explorers, so why don't we expand our programming? So in our building, still very much a children's museum. Outside of the building, we have a lot of these programs that really take the, the STEM piece into it. The other piece I will throw out there is that Maine is the only state in the country without a science museum. So there is a huge need for people who know what they're doing with informal science, which is these guys, to get out to the community and connect the dots between the classroom and the, the outside world. And this is where I hand off to you on. Autumn Allen, Director of Operations. You can sit. You know, I just I can't, I can't talk and stand or talk and sit. <laughs> uh, so yes, my name is Autumn Allen. I'm the Director of Operations at the Maine Discovery Museum. I oversee the visitor experience team as well as the facilities team. So that's kind of how I fit into these big exhibit projects. Uh, obviously, the facility has to undergo um, demo and then rebuilding of exhibits. We have to make sure everything is safe, find the best products at the best price, you know, all those little details uh, for um, installing these massive interactive uh, opportunities for the community. So this is our, oh, I agree, I say it really. <laughs> um, so in 2001 when we opened, we did open with a river experience, a water play uh, exhibit, which is pretty common in science and children's museums. Everybody loves playing with water, zooming boats down. So it was a very loved exhibit. It was built into the space. So when they built all the exhibits, they really didn't ever think about taking them out. Um, so you can kind of see some from, from some of these pictures that these are, you know, fiberglass and con like concrete, what they're just really sturdy exhibits built into the walls and the floors of the museum. Um, over 20 years of water play, a lot of water did get kind of into the, uh, the floors and the walls. 
and eventually even the, the plumbing kind of started um, falling apart within the infrastructure. So it was very difficult to just replace the small parts that needed to be replaced. And so in 2019, shortly before uh, the COVID pandemic shut us down, we had already turned the water off in our river exhibit, knowing that it needed a full, full remodel. Um, Excuse me, Audrey. Do you mind if you go over there? Oh, sure. The Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what you're seeing here is the original exhibit with some of our original friends playing. Um, so the first thing that we had to do was rip everything out. It was a pretty massive uh, demo, <laughs> a few demo days of, of just sledgehammering and ripping out all of the components of the original river exhibit. And then also the aquaculture exhibit, which when we originally opened in uh, 2001 was our paper factory. Um, and then as we kind of saw that the paper industry, industry changing in Maine, we swept, swept over the list went to aquaculture, basically. So all that uh, was relatively new construction that we all also had to rip down. So you're kind of seeing the walls half up and people working on tearing walls down. Um, you can see from this picture a little bit of the, the water damage that was done. Um, again, this is just everybody hauling out. And we, like, we actually had to cut big chunks of the wall out before we could uh, even remove some of the components. So lots of demo that took, um, it took a few months. This is a good picture that shows you how it was built in. Mm -hmm. This is all like the dirty background that no one ever talks about with the museum stuff, so we figured since we had time, we would give you the <laughs> whole background on how these types of things work. Um, and at one point, we were worried that we, like the structure of the wall was dependent on the exhibit. Yeah. So that yeah. was actually part of figuring this out, was making sure that the walls themselves were going to be OK. And yeah. the reason why we did that historically <laughs> is because our, all of our exhibits were designed and conceptualized by a super creative person who was running a firm that specialized in building, in building store and mall displays. Mm. So they, they were really good looking, but they were not children's museum interactives. So they looked really, really good, and then we played them into the ground. <laughs> and this is a really good point that Trudy yeah. brings up, that you know we have connections throughout the country throughout the world with other science museums and children's museums, but we don't have great opportunities here in Maine for exhibit um, building. You know, anytime we, if yeah. we're gonna buy a, a, an exhibit from somebody that really focuses on children's museums and science centers, we're looking at going to, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, Boston a little bit, and so we're bringing people in, which is very expensive, uh, and the exhibits themselves are also very expensive. So. We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So lots of, <laughs> lots of demo, still more demo. It was, it was a lot of demo. But as we were ripping things out, I think just like any like old house project, we knew that there would be water damage. We didn't know exactly what we would find. Uh, we were actually a little happy. I, every, you know, the floor, big chunks of the floor um, did need to be replaced. The support beams in the basement, we had three massive uh, beams that needed to be replaced. So. A lot of un, you know under this floor level work happening. Um, it's not pretty. It's pretty labor intensive, expensive, uh, and nobody's really seeing it. But it, but after this demo part, we got rid of all the old stuff. We found well, this is actually our original pool in the basement. Uh, you can see the the floor under the liner of the pool itself was completely rotten. So we actually had to to move the entire pool uh, to a brand new location and still in the basement and reline it. So lots of water damage. Um, this is our basement where the pool is. The I blue under the corner. Pool because yes. that's really yeah. fun. It's like an inside joke. Yeah. It's, at, it's, it's more like a hot tub. Uh, <laughs> and we do have to take certification courses to for pool safety, though nobody would ever swim in this pool. We had uh, a funny marketing mishap this summer. Yeah, yes, we did have people thinking all of a sudden in the summer that there was a pool that they could <laughs> swim in and we had to uh, kind of send out some new messaging that the pool was not for swimming in, it was just to uh, flow the river. So this is our new pool with a new liner in the basement. Again, a lot of you know detailed, expensive work that kind of happened underground. Um, 
So we get the question a lot, why is it taking so long? Part of it is a lot of work is being done that people don't see. Yeah, um, and now we're gonna kind of start switching over to Trudy's part where um, this is kind of one of our ideas for the, the layout. This is really early on when we had taken the concept, we, we decided we couldn't go with you know, the $350,000 project that was bringing in exhibit pieces from, from out of state. We were gonna do it in-house um, with our extraordinarily creative uh, Miss Trudy and our hard, hard or small but mighty team. So we had some ideas that we kind of just spaced out what we were working with and then um, and then kind of just explore it in there. Okay. So here, so I will run through these really quickly. I'm gonna go back to this really okay. just, and then you get it. Yeah. And then, and then, and then, let's see if I can I don't know how to make the laser go. You see that? Then I just want to give you a context for how expensive these things are. So we got a grant from the from USDA for fifty thousand dollars that we had to match one to one. So we have a hundred thousand dollars theoretically to play with, except the hundred the the fifty dollar match can also be in kind support or materials. I mean, it, so basically we have fifty thousand dollars free, and then everything else we got to raise. Um, that if you look where it says the interactive water table, just that that rectangle, that's probably twice the size of this table lengthwise, $250,000 from an exhibit manufacturer. So no, no branches, no, just basically a table. So that's, that's what we were struggling to try to figure out. And that does not include the pool and the plumbing and all the things that's that the table we have to do in-house. In that is the design and ship, shipping of, of professional. Right. So, we did this to try to explain in, uh, what, did I, what did I call it in-house? Brutal honesty about what's taking so long. So we put these pictures up and then tried to explain, you know, the demo, which we did as cheaply as possible with people who were really kind to us was $15,000. All right, so now we're down to $35,000 and we still don't have a table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, look, $20,000 to do the, now we're at, what do we have, $15,000 left and we still don't have a water table. We still don't have the plumber set up. We don't have anything about the Penobscot River, which is exactly the part where, like, the whole point of this, which I forgot to mention, which is a point why Beth, of course, asked me to talk, is we weren't just doing a water table for the sake of play. The whole exhibit is going to be about the Penobscot River watershed and how critical it is to our area, but also the state. So we're directly connecting this whole exhibit right to me. And, and kids don't care, right? Kids are like, water, pool. Cool, I'll play. But the grown-ups who have to be in that room for an hour because their kids are psyched about, we're going to teach them about the Penobscot River watershed, whether you know whether they want to know about it or not, because of the way we've designed it. And the really cool thing is just how much you can actually teach and provide yeah. with with the river at, as kind of the center focus. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot. Yeah. So now now this is the sweet spot. Now you get Trudy, okay. which is really who should be talking this whole time because oh. this is. Here we go. Um, so sorry. Trudy's the director of education at the museum okay, so for over 20 years. Like, yeah. yeah. 20 years. <laughs> 20. Okay, so I, I hope you don't mind if, I, if I'm like sitting, is that okay? And also, I have to warn you, I've been an educator in the Children's Museum slash Science Center for 23 years, so there will be some interactive parts. <laughs> um, so you might as well just come a little closer now. If you are, but it's okay if you, if you stay seated where you are, if you're comfortable, okay? So real quick, you notice that I have an accent, right? I'm from Germany, and my education is actually a humanist education. I went to a humanist gymnasium, gymnasium, uh, that was a seminary school run by Augustinian monks who were pretty salty when the German government forced them to open their seminary to females in the 70s, one generation before I came on. But So I went through um, a humanistic education. So. Uh, even though I had to kind of Google it, what that means in, at an American university, I'm like, oh, oh okay. So, um, so you you heard and you saw what a heavy, heavy lift it was. Um, if you own an old house, if you ever owned an old house, if you're thinking about owning an old house and you did any renovation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How nothing ever goes as planned. How there's nothing but usually bad surprises when you take down drywall or try to move a doorway. I mean, and for us it's particularly bad because we are a, a you know, industrial age, early industrial age building, so we have plenty of steel 
and three feet brick walls um, in, instead of just post and beam and drywalls. But that means that it's even harder just to change the width of a doorway or get supplies in an oven. Not, let me not even start talking about our heating and HVAC <laughs> <laughs> electric system. So, so why did we bother? Why did we bother ripping out this space other than the obvious that it needed to go? And then to put in another water feature into a place that was not designed clearly to have a 20 foot wide open water source. Um, well, and why make it about the Penobscot River? And I want you to close your eyes if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, think a little bit about uh, your favorite experience at or with water, your favorite outdoor place that you go to or have gone through that is a water place, a river or the coast um, or your camp or any of the, or lake, any of those places. And to show you what I mean, my favorite, my favorite water experience in Maine, and there are many, is Jasper Beach. When you sit quietly at the beach and the, t the waves roll in and they turn all these round pebbles, and turn them all over at the same time, and it sounds like a rain stick. So if you, if you want to, you can share. Does anybody want to share their experience? Like, what is your favorite water place in Maine? But I bet you all have one, right? I bet you all have one. Uh, and Maine is, is a unique place. It's a wild place. It's one of the, the few really wild places in Maine. It even has wide areas uh, on the map at the Allagash. And rivers and oceans, uh, speak to a shared human experience. We all, humans seek water, mammals seek water. We love to sit by streams, we love to go to the lake and to the ocean because water is, is life-giving. Uh, water connects us. Rivers are the primary travel roads since humans began exploring and expanding outside of their communities. And that's how we connect with other humans across cultures and wide spaces. And oceans and rivers always go somewhere. They always go to a different place, a bigger place, a place that we haven't been. And that speaks to our need to dream and imagine. And we have the Penobscot River, who is one of, um, which is one of six heritage rivers in the United States. It's one of the salmon rivers. Um, it has a fascinating history, and it's, it's been cleaned up. We've messed with it plenty of times, and we've been cleaning it up, but the Penobscot is one of those, those rivers that, that uh, connect Mainers to each other and connect them from one end of the state to the other. So that's why we needed the Penobscot River in our museum because we want to be about Maine but also about the greater world beyond and getting kids to think about how we are all part of the shared human experience and connect to the greater world beyond. And it speaks to uh, shared values that we have about the need to be stewards of our waterships uh, sh um, and the need to express ourselves and the need to physically connecting to spaces and to water. If you have ever encountered any children in your life close to a water source, that you know that you can't keep them from not going into that water. <laughs> Whether it's dirty or cold or dangerous, they, they don't care, right? They're going to jump in the puddle, they're going to want to touch, they're going to want to lick the icicles. At the minimum, they want to throw something into it to see what happens, right? So there's, there's for humans have a need to physically engage with spaces. That's why Children's Museums and Science Centers Pretty much all of them have water features, even though they are very, very difficult to build and maintain. Um, we've seen the one in Portland. It's so much fun. But I, we, we, we see people are like, oh, OK, OK. It, it looks like it's a nightmare to just keep dry enough to clean. <laughs> but they put it in there for the same reason we're going to put one in there, even though it's in the middle of, of this old building. Because we need to, we have to. That's, uh, gives kids an opportunity to make these connections, to experience shared values, to touch water, and the need 
for understanding their physical world. And there's so much cool science packed into water from the molecule level to the ocean, to the biggest bodies of waters we have. There's physics and chemistry, buoyancy, eddies, currents, floating and sinking. One of the earliest science experiments that anyone who does science with kids does is the floaty and sinky experiment. One of the earliest science experiments that kids do without any kind of prompting is throwing stuff in the water and see what happens, right? <laughs> Including themselves. <laughs> um, and it also speaks to a connection with other kids playing together and the connection to these places that are bigger than ourselves. So we never talked about it, but we kind of don't have to because that's kind of printed into our DNA. That, that water is important and that water is fun and that you can do stuff with it, it's, it's, we don't need to discuss it. We are all agreeing on this, right? From, from every age that this is a fun thing to have in, in the museum, but we were kind of mindful on a subconscious level. What, what does that mean for designing the space? What does that mean for um, designing the experience where Autumn came in? And then who do we need to bring to the table? artists, welders, builders, um, engineers, and scientists. So one of the things that one of the dads said to me when we first kind of opened the river up to let a bunch of little kids and sponsors and adults explore was, you know, if you're quiet, I just love the sound the water makes. That's because he came before the kids came. <laughs> so he was there a little bit early and he just sat on the bench. He's like, listen to this, this is, I love this. Because you could just hear the water running down the river, right? That is also a shared human experience. So deciding our space, we had to take into account that this is within the museum a unique space. We have the highest ceilings in that area, we have the most daylight with the highest ceilings. That means um, sound carries differently. But it also allowed us to design something that from a space perspective was very open and felt very chill and relaxed. Again, we haven't tried it with three field trips because I'm pretty sure that's not gonna be the same. But for a daily visitor who comes with their own family or their own children, it's, it's, it's a very nice space to be in. It's a bright space, it's an open space, there's airflow, there's sunlight, um, I'm going to make you talk about this thing. What? The, the murals and how you go. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, that, yeah. So, um, so we, 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 look, we, we looked at the sound and the air and then um, the art. So if we have a space that is already bright and airy and feels relaxed, what does the art need to look like? Um, you would think if you go into a children's museum, we need bright colors and cute cartoons and da action. But it's, that's not true. Uh, we've, over the years, we've worked with um, artists who specialize in exhibit design and space design for children with sensory issues. Yes, colorful is nice, but no. We need to think about colors and art for children's spaces a little bit differently. Just because they're little kids, doesn't mean they have to have really bright, clashing primary cartoon Disney type colors. So one thing that the space allowed us to do was scale up the art quite significantly. Everywhere else in the museum is ceiling height like you would have in a normal house with like 11 feet. So, so you, can't, you can't really have this big art pieces because they just get lost, because it's, there's people there and they're stuck there and then there's walking on. But in this space we have, ceiling height, no, 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 no. Yeah. okay, okay that's fine. Okay. So in this space we have ceiling height. This isn't the space, just so you know. Uh, no, this is, this, we had to put the, the panels into a different room so that the artists could work in peace. Um, and it's colorful, it has little pops of color, but overall, it's, it's visually big and impactful and like the river itself, it's, it's, a, it's a big river, so the art is big. But the colors are kind of subdued a little bit because they're, they're you know, based on nature, they're kind of relaxed. And the panels were actually a stroke of genius because one of the things we've learned over the years too is that if you have a mural artist, it always breaks their heart a little bit when we make a building change and we just 
break it all down. And I had the same experience when my little muscles and seashells were taken off all. Because in the upper farm, hey, you know what? I can. I, it's I, fine. <laughs> so when we when we had the original aqua farm, I lovingly epoxied real seashells and oysters into the wall, and then did like a trunk loyal where I painted some. And then they had to go because the space had to go. I'm like, but but. That was and so and actually, the, the aquaculture room that yeah. she's referring to, the same artist did the inside yeah. of that. I'm not sure if any of you had an opportunity to see it. It was beautiful inside yeah. there. It was heartbreaking to just tear, just tear it all tear, down. Tear, just take a session. And it. that's really when we were like, we've got to do this differently. So yeah. I will I will jump in. So this is yeah. Chess Cherry, for those of you who don't know him. Um, and, and he, uh, this was Trudy's original, uh, we, we want to tell the story of the Penobscot from, mm -hmm. and so up at, in a minute you'll see all of the panels that, mm -hmm. that Chess did, but, it worked because one of my board members saw it and she said, oh, it's the whole watershed. That's what you guys are doing with And this. that was before we even lived And that was before we even talked like, about yes, it, right? So, yeah. but, so Trudy kind of did this really quickly to show Ches what she was thinking and then Ches took it and because he had had the experience of having his work just torn down, we said, well, why don't yeah. you put it on wood that we can, and, and, so it could be moved, so we mm -hmm. can do something with it. So my only complaint with all the work that Ches did is he didn't sign any of these pieces. Mm -hmm. After I asked him, I kid you not, five or six times. So, but Ch Ches is funny because he I and I have been working together for a long time. So he's a mural artist, but because there's this strange divide in art between utilitarian art or transactional art, like I paint this for this and then get paid for this versus I have this overflowing spring of creativity and blah, here it is. <laughs> and there seems to be kind of like a divide or some, maybe some artists see that way. Some, some people, artists are very easily tra transversing those two words. Like, I create this because I also need to pay my rent, so here's the picture of your dog or whatever. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna circle so, back to this. Yeah, so we're gonna get him, maybe he would like for him to sign because he, he did a really beautiful He job. did. Yeah. We're gonna, so we've talked all about the river and hmm. what, and I still, you know, at last count, we had ten thousand dollars left because yeah. I had to pay Chez because you know I think artists should be paid among many other things. Approximately ten thousand dollars left. So this is Jesse Lupo. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. It's okay because I was going to talk about him too. Okay, <laughs> um, I will introduce Jesse. So Lupo. segue. You can yeah. tell we have rehearsed this, right? Like, yeah. We. So Jesse is um, is one of the your co-owner, right? Yeah. Of, of Mossy Ledge Spirits, uh, but more importantly in our case, a, a beautiful craftsman welder, yeah. because to make spirits you need an extraordinary still that will withstand a lot of things. So I knew Jesse because of the science festival during COVID, we did a, an online session about businesses that responded to the pandemic and they were businesses that you didn't expect to be as part of the conversation and Mossy Ledge Spirit was part of the conversation because they had all this alcohol that they then figured out, Jesse gathered a whole group of people and, and transformed it into hand sanitizer at a yeah. time when you couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah. So you could go okay, and then look, you can conduct it and then I'm Jesse will take over. Okay. Also, it's probably like not so veiled clue that I'm talking to him. <laughs> I told you I'm going to off. Okay, okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to branch this up here real quick. So, so Ch Ches, the artist, was able to communicate and translate these big science concept concepts about conservation and sustainability and the whole watershed, which is you know, a very, very different ecosystem from where the river starts to where it goes at the ocean. Um, and you know, the problems that the river faces into visual art. Um, so he, he used art to translate geography and topography and technology with the, with the offshore wind turbines and the history, uh, the way the, the river was utilized in the Bangor area, into a visual clue that we can then use to engage parents and teach the content that is important us from a science perspective by making these stunning visuals that are not intruding on the experience in that space that we didn't even know was going to be Way it is, and uh, and then we have a metal worker, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with. It. There's a huge amount of very very big brain science in the <laughs> uh, On a molecular level, it's, it's astonishing what you need to know. But 
but but then again, metalwork has always been part of human history since the you know the Bronze Age, basically. Um, so there's also an intuitive aspect, and then Jesse did it the other way around, where he came from this very technical um, kind of, of standpoint, and was able to use his creativity and his imagination and his ingenuity to literally bend steel to emulate the flowing of a river. Um, and then we, of course, have these beautiful uh, parts that are collaboration and they intersect at the experience of the children, which is the, the experience of play, which again <coughs> is a universally shared human experience. Great. Take it away. So. Do you want to sit here? No, I'm going to stand up. Okay. I can. <laughs> if you could come over to the Move it So, um, as like Kate said, we had met back um, when the big gig, well, actually, even before that, we were reached out to as a distillery to supply alcohol to the University of Maine who was looking to create hand sanitizer and we were doing the same thing. There was about 800 distilleries across the United States that were all reached out for that same thing. We did about 6,000 gallons of hand sanitizer during the pandemic to help out and we also pride ourselves in having sold that at pre-COVID pricing. So that was one of the things that we felt really good about and we weren't looking for praise about that but we were invited onto a Zoom call with Dr. Jill Biden, former second lady, now first lady. And uh, you know the, the university and a lot of other uh, parts were thanked for their parts in how we pivoted to help with uh, the pandemic. And so when this issue come up for these guys of looking at spending 280 to $350,000 for a water table, it was a fairly simple thing, it was attractive, um, but not necessarily modular once it was built. And um, so she reached out to me and said, hey, uh, well, stainless, do you think you can build something? And I'm like, let's take a look at it. Let's, let's get together on it. So we've only been, been together a few times during the planning and execution of this. And, you know, I, I got very excited because it's a community project. And it's a really cool project, too. So when we looked it over and I looked at the space, hey, look at that. We, uh, <laughs> we started talking about the concept what we wanted to, to display, which was the, the two lakes that would feed falls to the river, the rivers to combine together, the rivers go to the ocean. And that flow, we wanted the kids to be able to play in it, reach in it, um, you know, the interactive part of this. And so my thoughts were, okay, stainless steel, sharp edges, cut throats, hands chopped off. I mean, I had all the horrible yeah. visions of the things that could go wrong with that. So. We start talking about metal and bending metal. I've worked with metal since, uh, well, since I was a kid, really. But in, in 1989, I started as a welder. So a lot of years of, of different experiences brought me to a place where I can pretty much mend any two pieces of metal together in some way or another. So, you know, of course, they indicated that the budget didn't exist. And I said, I understand <laughs> that. And so we just covered cost. It was me and my father-in-law. And when we started into the project, we come up, we took a look at the space, and we started literally drawing on the floor. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of um, outlining the space and figuring out how we can get wheelchairs around if need be. Um, that it's a, uh, but maximize, you know, make it as long and, and as impressive as we could. And um, so this piece that you're looking at here, these two are a couple of the lakes themselves. We decided to make them brown and that they would feed up from the middle. And, um, Sure. This is, uh, yeah, this is us carrying in the ocean right now. Larry and I, there we go. Don't ding the walls, Larry. <laughs> so we bring it in and we set it. And we had hash marks on the floor. And you can see that the drain comes up through the floor right there. We're about to set that down over. These hash marks on the floor were when they just had, the demo was done. They were starting to rebuild. They had a plan on what was going to be the floor. It was going to be four inches of concrete. I thought that's great, we can hook to the concrete. And as things do with old uh, remodels, which I've done a lot of remodeling like you talked about, um, they couldn't put the concrete on the floor because it, it's extremely heavy. Uh, concrete's deceivingly heavy. So they went to a wood floor with this, I think it's a, a, a membrane, a rubber membrane, yes, something along that lines. So getting these pieces, we actually laid it out on the floor on the concrete at my shop, and we built each piece and we set them on their target points and then we made the connecting rivers. Um, what I, you know, understanding the budget again, reached out to the people that I've worked with for a lot of years. 
I've given them a lot of money. It turns out way more than I should have. Because what they did, and, and hats off to them, Troy Industrial, actually, um, it's, they couldn't gift the material to us, which is what I kind of alluded to that maybe they could do. But what they did is they sold it to us at cost. And that was impressive. And um, like I said, I've worked with them a lot of years back when it was uh, lane conveyors and, and such. And it was, it was really great. So they really stepped up and gave us this material at their cost. They also gave us their labor. So some of this work that you see, um, the bed pieces like these right here, that's 10 gauge stainless. It's a little heavier than um, an eighth of an inch. And these pieces are all modular. We built this at the shop, complete. We actually flowed water through it, which was fun. I'm a big kid. I, I'm the first kid who also found out things that we needed to fix on that once we started flowing water through it. But once we had it all built and everything, I mean, I actually literally myself jumped up on these pieces, ran up and down them, jumping up and down on them, making sure that they weren't going to give out, making sure that they were strong enough. And these top pieces are half inch thick bar stock, and, and that, it gives it a rounded edge. So that if, if anybody was to fall on that, it's not a knife edge that's sticking up. Uh, we put a, a coarse grind on those so that if we can do the epoxy and make these things um, a little extra special that that's going to tie in nicely and as you can see these studs if you go back to that last slide Sorry. that's okay you see these studs sticking down there's actually a, they slide up through and there's a couple of bolts a couple of nuts and that's all it takes to hold that on that end so in a matter of i, I see minutes minutes for me and and larry if we if i can get it back he uh, we could take this apart and relocate it if we ever needed to um, once we got the pieces in place and we tried it, we got them, nice, all, got them all set, and when they were plumbed up and we started flowing water through them, we're trying to balance the water from the two sides so that those rivers come together and that it doesn't overflow, but that there's a nice impressive flow as it goes, and then it heads on down to the ocean. And um, it's, it's at a point right now where the finishing touches are gonna go on, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it was a really fun project, and the in-kind that she talked about, I just saw that is we'll do it for as little as we can. And um, I think we did all right. We did fine. So <laughs> I have a couple things to add because it's me. Um, so th this is representing both the east and the west branch of the Penobscot going in together. So oh. we're really trying to, the parts that we don't have yet, this is, this is, so this is the watershed with Chez's. Those are now mounted from when I took this picture. And included in that is all the science pieces, some of the science pieces that yeah. Trudy was talking about. You know, like all things, this project was supposed to be done in the summer. Not, not like all things. The project was supposed to be done in the summer. Like every other large scale project. You guys are all nodding, right? So you all get it. We, we are, the goal now is January is a really hard, cold month. So near the end of January, we're going to do a big grand opening of this. And included in, so now these are all mounted. The water's flowing rapid so kids, because kids are going to find where they can hurt themselves on it no matter what we do. But we'll also have the science part of it, connecting it and talking about the history of the Penobscot and the way it's impacted people and the water cycle and above those other things. There's one other piece to this that we did that we realized, I don't know if you saw here, where it says, can you spot the storm drain? So one of the things we realized as we were putting this in is that we're right on Main Street where, where this exhibit is, and one of the partners for a long time with the Maine Science Festival has been the Bangor Area Stormwater Group which I think they say is Baswig, but I don't, it just is a <laughs> weird acronym, right? But basically it's the, it's the towns, it's Orono, it's Bangor, and, and, and they have to address stormwater runoff. And a huge part of what they're trying to address is to get people to understand that the storm drains that exist flow right to the river. Yeah. So it seemed like this natural opportunity for us to help get that message across. So this is where you're gonna see kind of the fun, more kid stuff that Trudy was talking about. It's at the very end of the exhibit. See, at the, the part where the ship is, the, that actually I'm gonna throw, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to get money from these guys because, because they're a nonprofit too, so I should of course take money from them. That big ship that's in that last panel is actually the research vessel that Bigelow Laboratory uses when they go out to sea. So I asked Chez to put that in there. So that's just like we're trying to hit the different pieces. On the other side of that panel is where this poster is, helping to explain to people, if you're throwing drain stuff down the drain, this is the stuff that is really gonna hurt us. And this is explaining what it all is. And the one thing, I don't have a picture of it, because I, 
because I just don't, but I don't know for Come the Maine Science Festival this year, which is a program at the Discovery Museum. We are doing a con we're going to announce a contest with school kids where the storm drain they, it's, uh, the storm drain that's right outside our building. Uh, we're going to convince Public Works that they should let us paint that <laughs> non-toxic paint in the summer. So we're going to have a contest with kids to design some type of oh in summer camp oh no no no, no, no I'm not just, doing it. No. So we're going to have a contest where kids get to design yeah. what that storm drain paint yeah. what that will look like. It's the idea is to connect it to the water. If you get a chance, go and look up storm drain art. It's extraordinary. It's so cool. So. We're going to do this as a test project, announce it at the festival, give kids a couple of months to do a design. My hope is that the coming years will hit at least a storm drain in every school area, because every school's got a storm drain. We can support that. And we just start using art and connect the dots that way so that it gives us the opening to talk about some of the science that's happening. Yeah. I think we've had these silos between art and humanities and science for so long that we've forgotten that we all need each other. So we're trying to figure out ways to break that down. And this partnership is actually super cool because of how nicely, one, it fits already into the exhibit, so the real basic connections that we're able to mm -hmm. make to with children, because we have a, you know our beaver habitat in that area, really clearly connecting things that go in the storm drain are ending up in these habitats, so that's important. But also the, the opportunity for us to reach beyond just our audience that comes into the museum mm -hmm. to share the really important message that we all you know need to be good stewards and yeah. It's, you yeah. know, the, the, the rivers connect us all for better or for worse. Unfortunately, they also connect all of our stuff to everything else. And that is a conversation that we also would like parents and children to, to have at home about what does it mean when you throw stuff in the river. Yeah, and, and again, just that really, I mean, there's so many connections we're yeah. able to make and, and really important messages that we're able to share with families and with the river as the center, you know, piece of the conversation. So not included in this are all the conversations that we've had, including with different uh, parts of the Wabanaki about how do we do programming to talk about their work, connected to our work. Um, what this space gives us is we've realized, not necessarily through planning, but because we're lucky that we now have this kind of big open space near the river where we can talk about this and have people in it and really address it. Are there any questions? I will say, so I will say what, one thing. We, this is the only water table like this you will find anywhere in the country. It is a bespoke water table, and I am so yeah. proud of that. And what I am really, really proud of actually is this whole thing has been designed in-house and built in Maine, and it's only happened because of the community that has rallied around. Like, I didn't go looking for you know, they gave us some financial support to make this happen. I didn't go looking for that. They came to us, and I was like, oh, what a great idea. We should totally partner up with you guys and do this. Yeah. And it's been really great and satisfying and exciting to be able to bring in these pieces and be able to have, you know, we have the, the person who hasn't been represented on here is another artist we've spoken to, Jez Plos Plosky, I can never say her last name right. Who were, who, Plosé. Plosé, thank you. Back when we thought we had a different floor, she had designed this whole whole part of the floor that was going to be showing the Gulf of Maine and different depths and everything and then you know she did all this work and I was like I'm really sorry we can't do any of that and she's like that's okay I'll do the next one but having these conversations with different people and different organizations has fostered a lot of really exciting ideas for us for programming and for just helping get ideas across in a really thoughtful way this has been through I want to say 20 iterations probably mm -hmm. like how do we tell this story this way we, we aren't, I don't know that we're there yet, but we've got much better ideas. Yeah. So. Y'all want to go play in it now, don't you? <laughs> sure. I can tell you, as soon as the water was flowing, yeah. I was in there and I'm looking at it, and uh, of course I know it's flowing up from one pump mm -hmm. through two holes and they're balanced. So I walked over just like any other kid, put my hand over the one that was flowing in and the other one shot up in the air pretty good. Mm -hmm. There was a little kid in there, he was probably yeah. six or eight yeah. maybe, and he went over to the other one and he put his hand over it and he was squirting it sideways. I'm like, oh, we're going to have a blast with this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for showing them that. Everybody. Absolutely. They would have figured it out. <laughs> Just made something that we can fix, which I've worked with parts for. So, could you just, like, the pools downstairs, could you just talk about that? Because I think that's a really 
Yeah, in the basement. Mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Goes in and just cycles through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually really important. Um, I actually had, I was fortunate enough to talk to a children's, a, a person who runs a children's museum in, in Virginia, and they have a water exhibit, and it's all static water. Mm -hmm. So they have to empty it, and they have to drain it, and clean it every week. And my, when she was telling me that, my first thought was like, I think I'd bring my kid in the beginning of the week. Like, I don't think I'd go at the end of the week. So, mm -hmm. So the flow is really important, and that's why the that's why the pool is so important because it's also clean water. Like it's constantly being. It's really it's, it's exactly like a it's a salt water system, uh, just like a hot tub. So we the, you know the chlorine level is a little high because of how many hands are going in, but it's a it's a really balanced, safe system, which is part of the expense is getting you know all the systems in place to monitor the safety of the water. Um, because it is getting. And that adds actually another complication because Jesse was kind enough to tell me that the worst thing for stainless steel is chlorinated water. <laughs> so that's, yeah. a, that's a whole other thing we've had to think about. And that's one of the things you pay for when you buy from an exhibit designer, right? They're not going to give you stainless steel, they're going to do it with some other material. So. And for us, the, the first filter, everything goes through the safety. You know, and if it doesn't pass that filter, then it doesn't pass, period. There's no workarounds, there's no compromise. If we can't make it 100% safe for 100% of the kids to the very, very best and highest of our knowledge, then it's just not gonna work. That's the one compromise where we, you know, push back against somebody who has a creative idea or somebody who wants to build something. It's like, yeah, sorry, you know. That's where it's really good to have a lot of people in the room, because yeah. different people think of what things are, what kids are gonna think of doing. So what if analysis? So I would say it's 95% done, and now what's left is the part that makes it look like a river. Yeah. Right now, right, you just it, it's This is actually the best. It's, this is going to be all the connections. Yeah. And the, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it. Thank you.